volume on. I can't hear it. No, I can't hear me. So I want to make sure they hear Brother Brian's recording back there to make sure we get back out on Facebook and YouTube for those that are not in the services. And uh, look behind me. You see that? Yes, sir. Amen. I tell you what, I, I've been looking forward to this day. I'm excited. I don't know about y'all. Welcome back. We miss you. And uh, uh, praise the Lord. I know we were out in our cars and all, but it's not like you and I see when you're in the car a glare on the windshield. You know, I don't get to see y'all in here. I get to see your faces and all. So we are glad that you're back with us today in our services. And uh, let us get started today and have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless these services today. So uh, let's pray today. Brother McGill, would you lead us in prayer today? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for the many blessings. We thank you for the ones that are here today. We all come back and we thank you for bringing us to our church. Again, Lord, we pray for the ones that need some prayer today. The ones that are still sick. Touch them, Lord, and keep them. Come for the ones that want to find me, the ones that have lost homes. Be with them, Lord, through this time. I hear you thank you all for this day, for the beautiful day. Thank you for this church. We hope to be grateful also for not bringing back to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day. Amen. 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 Uh, let me give you a few announcements. Uh, let me give you two names to put on your prayer list in all. Uh, I was just told Brother Ray Bass is in St. Vincent's Hospital. And uh, he's been there a little while. I've been sick for a couple weeks. So we want to be praying for him. Also, Miss um, Mail and Brother Larry, and she had just, I just talked to her Thursday, and she said, we are looking forward to Sunday, being back inside the sanctuary and everything. And then Brother Larry sent a text, and she's sick of uh, the mess that she's got and so forth. And she is going to be having surgery here soon, here uh, this month of May. I forgot the date right now, but she's fixing to have surgery. They got a schedule, so we'll be praying for her with that and all. Uh, uh, here's some information. We're going to continue just a 10 a.m. service, I think until June. Then we'll get back into adding our Sunday night, our Wednesday night in all. Now, I, right now I just feel like this is where we need to be, what we need to be doing, okay? Uh, and so this is where we're heading. I want people to have confidence again. I want to hear what uh, is going on with the virus. You know, one thing they're afraid of is people will go back uh, to doing life normal and all of a sudden it peaks again. Uh, so I, I want everybody to be safe. I don't want to see that happen. I don't want to be our church that it takes place in, okay? So we're going to do things uh, different. Still going to be doing Gideon on uh, Wednesday nights on video. You'll still be able to see that. So uh, plan for doing that and all. But right now, we're just doing what we're doing and uh, then we'll eventually add and so forth. Here's the way I'm looking at us right now, with us planning to, with our process of selling, the process of purchasing and relocating up, I'm looking at us like we're a mission. Okay? And as a mission, you start out as with what you have, and you work from there and build from it, right? And so that's what we'll be doing through all this. Now guess what next Sunday is? Mother's Day. Amen? Um, so next Sunday, we're going to honor our mothers. We're going to have gifts for our mothers and all, all those that attend and are with us. So plan on that. But the Sunday after that, guess what that's supposed to be? Homecoming. Brother Tony back there saying, maybe kind of sad because you know what? We're not going to do homecoming. I've canceled the singer. I've canceled the preacher. I've done all that just because we don't know what's going on. Right? And, uh, but that's okay. As soon as things are back and great and normal, guess what? We're going to have a feast. Amen. Amen. We'll have us a great time around here. I'll hook us up some singers to come in and sing and get us a preacher in here to preach and all. Uh, maybe by then that young preacher I wanted to get in here out of Georgia will not be so booked. Uh, and we can get him in here and turn that young preacher loose in here. Uh, so those are things that are going on. Uh, that's coming up in the days ahead. So uh, keep praying for our church. Keep praying about the sale of these facilities. Keep praying about the uh, what's going on with the offer and so forth 
of the property up there. Uh, we're in negotiations, folks, and we're trying. What we need is prayer. We need God to work. We need God to move in. God to be in control of all this and to work all these things out for us and all. And um, I'll just go ahead and tell you, I wish he'd work faster. <laughs> Amen? I just get impatient sometimes. I want, you know me, I'll get out about five feet ahead of God and say, can you come on? I'm like a kid going to the candy store. And I, and I want to say, come on, God, hurry up, hurry up. But pray for your pastor that I can wait on God and be patient and trust the Lord and know that his hands in all these things because I'm looking forward to the day we move up there. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, y'all ready to sing today and worship? Amen. Amen. Wait, wait, stop. Time out, stop. <laughs> this is a repeat. What do they call it? What I call it here while I have my message? A redo. That's a redo. It's a redo. Are you ready to worship and sing today? Yeah. All right. I thought y'all would be so excited about being in the house of God today. Y'all would be saying, Woo! Hallelujah! Glory! Amen? Amen. There you go. Y'all get a little bit of excitement in you. Maybe if you'll sing, you'll do that. So, Brother Greg, come on. Maybe this song will get you going. When the roll is called up yonder, let's stay together.
reason. Praise the Lord. i 
Brother Greg, whenever he sat down, he says, Boy, it's so good to be back. Yeah. I said, Amen. And you know why he was so excited about it? Because he could hear y'all singing. Yeah. And we were inside the church worshiping. Amen. Yeah. And that makes a difference. Sitting in the car is kind of hard. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You just don't get that fellowship like you need and all. So I'm so excited today with this. Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 36. We're going to be reading verses 27 through 31 today. Jeremiah chapter 36. This week, as I was here in the office, I was praying about what to preach today. And all, and, uh, you know, I, I even thought about it. Could have preached on when Hezekiah restored the temple. And everybody came back to worship. But that's what the Lord put on my heart. He brought me to Jeremiah to preach out of it. And, uh, and here in Jeremiah, one thing we find out is God will accomplish His work. Amen. Amen. His word is not going to return to His void. Jeremiah chapter 36, I know you've been standing, but I'm going to ask you one more time. Psalms um, to read the Word of God, that you'd stand, and we'll begin at verse 27, and I'll begin reading there. Then the Word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Boy, I tell you what, it's good to be a preacher and have the Word of God speak to you and to deal with you. And here it was, God's given Jeremiah the Word. By the way, the Word He gave him at that time is this book called Jeremiah. That's what he's recording here, okay? So then the Word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after that the king had burned the roll and the words which they wrote, wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again another roll, and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned. And thou shalt say to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Thus saith the Lord, and I tell you, whenever you see, thus saith the Lord, you better pay attention. Amen. Amen. Uh, thou hast burnt this roll, saying, Why hast thou written therein, saying, The king of Babylon shall certainly come and destroy this land, and shall cause to cease from thence man and beast. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out in the day of the heat and the night of the frost. And I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity. And I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the men of Judah all the evil that I have pronounced against them, but they hearken not. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch and uh, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. Let's pray for that. Father, God, thank you so much for letting us come back to the sanctuary. Thank you, Lord, for being present with us today, for us singing and worshiping together already today. Lord, I thank you for that. God, my heart is filled this morning. God, the joy that's inside, I thank you for that. Now, Lord, we come to the preaching of your word. I ask God to take control of my thoughts, uh, of my tongue, and God, just let me say what you won't say today. And Lord, I pray, God, you let the people hear your word. God, that the preaching would not fall on deaf ears, but people would be listening, and God, it would speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray, God, today that we might heed the word of God and that we might not try to destroy it or put it away. God, we'd accept it and turn to you, trusting you for wisdom and guidance. Now, Lord, we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Today, I'm going to do something here. And, and of course, if you, if you know, they tell you, um, you should do something to get everybody excited and start with, to get all their attention and, do these kind of things and so forth. But that's not the way the message goes. We start out with a history lesson. And you know, if you don't like history, then you're going to be bored for a few minutes. But I'm going to give you a little history lesson. 
And I want to give you some things to chew on also, that is to think on in also. Let me start here with a history lesson. And the history is on Israel and Judah. That's where I want to start with this afternoon, uh, today. Um, the nation of Israel, you know, makes up 12 tribes. And uh, these 12 tribes uh, were all named after Abraham's children, so Israel's children, and so forth. And these 12 tribes uh, were the, that one nation together. But then there came a split after Solomon was king. We got two that were Judah and ten that was the nation, Israel. Okay? And so we've got them. And the people of Judah are somewhat uh, divided up. And in Judah's uh, boundaries where it was is Jerusalem. You know what Jerusalem is, right, to the Jews? That there is their holy place. That is where the temple of God is. That's where they come and worship. It's a very important place, and it's just that capital to the Jewish people there in all. Well, because the Jews have turned their backs on God, Jehovah God at this time, God's removed his hand. I think about it. God has a protecting hand he places on his children. By the way, one good thing about God's hand, it does several things. One is it can put a hedge around us and protect us, right? Amen. And when we want to act like hmm, brats, <laughs> and we decide we want to climb over the fence, he's got the same hand can reach over and grab us and put us back, doesn't he? He's got a hand that can also spank his children if he needs to be. Well, here we've got Judah and all of Israel, by the way, who have turned from God, and he's removed his protecting hand from them. Now, I want you to think today, is that not what seems like is happening in America itself? I mean, we used to be called this Christian nation. We used to have the Bible in school. We used to have prayer. And we used to have people that said, oh, I'm saved. And you could find them in the house of God. They'd go to church and they'd live godly. But what do we see today in America? We see people who say, oh, I'm a Christian or I'm saved, but they live like the devil. They don't live like God expects us to live. Can I tell you, they're worshiping everything else in America except God. That's where Israel was. And I want you to understand, Israel got away from their God, away from Jehovah God in all. In America, that claimed to have been this Christian nation. Back under President Obama's, he said, we are not a Christian nation. And guess what? I, even though I hate them words, he was actually telling the truth because America had gotten away from God and we're still away from God. I don't like uh, having a president that has prayer. I like a president that says you can go and worship. You can. I like those things about my president and all. But does that mean we have really turned to God? See, Israel was that place. They hadn't been where they need to be with God and all. Uh, it is strange. Now, you be honest. Whether you've done this or you'll know somebody who's done this. They say they're saved, they say they're a Christian, but they don't never, they never turn to God until they need it. Mm -hmm. Right? That's when we turn to God. Somebody gets sick, somebody finds out they've got cancer, and I just wonder how many people who came down with this virus all of a sudden needed God. But prior to that, God wasn't in their plans. They just turned to the world and they worshiped the gods of this world. Well, Israel or Judah, let me make sure I say that Judah is there. Now, Israel is too, but I'm focusing on Judah and all. But both of them have turned their backs on God and they're now worshiping false gods. That's what they're doing. Now, um, let me take you and show you how Israel got to this horrible place, how Judah got to this horrible place, how the Jewish people got to this horrible place. Do you remember in the book of Exodus, Moses had went to the mountain, God gave him some commandments, ten of them, right? You remember the first four commandments was between man and God? Do you remember what was in those commandments right there? Thou shalt not worship any other God. You're not to worship any other God. You're not to worship anybody else. I'm a jealous God. I only want you worshiping me. And that's what God wanted. And he gave those commandments to Judah, to Israel.
Israel, to all the Jewish people and all. But guess what? They failed, didn't they? They failed because once they got into the land, what did they do? They started worshiping other gods. In fact, if you go all the way back to where they had the Ten Commandments, what did Moses do with the first set of commandments? Yep. And what had Israel been doing? Worship some cow? A golden cow that they made. I still have a problem. If you're worshiping some god you made, something ain't right. Amen? Because if you made then you're more powerful than that guy. But yet we want to worship that. We want to worship those kind of things. Well, prior to Judah and Israel going and having the problem and going, winding up into captivity and having God tell them all these things that's going to happen, they've gotten away from him. But there were eight kings that I want to just mention just for a moment. Before Judah's fall before Babylon walked in on Jerusalem and just took over and wiped them out for all that took place there were some kings. Let me start with Hezekiah first because Hezekiah was a great king. Hezekiah was a godly man. When Hezekiah became king, if you remember, the Bible talks about him. He loved the Lord. He loved the Lord. Can I tell you that's what we need today is people who love the Lord. People say, you, you say you're a Christian, but that doesn't mean you love the Lord. Because see, words are cheap, aren't they? You can claim whatever you want. I mean, we've seen some people out there, one woman said, I, I, I'm an Indian. That would be an Asian and got a drop of Indian blood in <laughs> I, I, I got to tell you a little story. My wife and I, if you look at my wife, she looks like an Indian. I always thought she was. I always thought she was Indian. I was always told that I had Indian blood in me. And guess what? We've done a DNA test. And a drop of Indian blood in either one of them. I'm still trying to figure out how the family stories that my grandmother's daddy or granddaddy was an Indian chief. <laughs> Obviously, that wasn't her real name. Something's not right because when you, we found out we both got Scotch Irish in And there's a little continent called Africa. And then we got some DNA from too. I'll tell you about my DNA. I got it, we were on that 23 me, and I reached out to some of the people, trying to find out a little bit more about the Whitaker family and so forth and on. And I had a guy from Chicago who was my fourth cousin who sent me a little message. And he ain't looking nothing like me. He looks like that percentage that come from Africa. Amen? And whenever I reached back and forth to him, he quit talking to me. I, I, you know? But you stop and you think about it. Hezekiah had something inside him. Maybe it came from his grandfather David that caused him to love the Lord. Love and care about the Lord and all. But here, we've got these eight kings. We start with Hezekiah. He loved the Lord. And remember I just mentioned to you, when he became king, he went down and he looked at the temple and he saw the temple and he saw the priest. And I just wonder what he saw the priest doing because obviously he didn't see the priest doing what was right because he told them, y'all need to get right with God. Y'all need to get this temple cleaned up and I want worship restored to it and I want y'all to get with it and do it. Now that's a person who loved God. Amen. Now, we can say we're Indians and not have a drop of blood in them, right? Of Indian. Don't make us an Indian. Just like saying I'm a Christian, don't make you a Christian. It's how we live, it's how we do, it's how we act that make us a Christian. And if you love the Lord, that's a good sign that you're a Christian. Amen? Amen. And then, he had that temple restored. Guess what? He got them back into the house of God. He got them back to worship like they should have. If you say, I'm a Christian, you'll love the Lord. It'll be evidenced by your worship. Not just coming to church, but by the worship. It comes out of the heart. He called the people to repent, to return to the Lord. He called the priests to repent and restore the worship. Also, guess what? He stopped there. Hezekiah got rid of all the idols. 
He destroyed them and got rid of them. And I'm going to tell you something. Y'all don't think this is about as foreign as it can be. But back in, I guess, the um, late 70s, early 80s, I can remember being at church and Brother Bumper got preaching about people getting rid of the sin out of their life and getting rid of the ungodliness of their life. And he said, tonight I'm going to have a 55-gallon drum out back. And if you got something that represents sin in your life, we're going to take it back there and throw it in the fire and burn it and get rid of it. I couldn't believe the stuff that was going in. That 55-gallon drum couldn't hardly hold the filth that people were trying to get rid of. I tell you what, it made it brought about a revival in our life because why? We got rid of it. We just didn't say we got right with God. We got rid of the stuff that caused us to sin. You think about that. That's what Hezekiah had done. If you're ever going to get right with God, you've got to get rid of the idols. You've got to get rid of those things in your life. When after Hezekiah died, and by the way, he was king for 57 years, and God was blessing Israel during that time. But you go on, guess what? There's some ungodly kings that followed him. There's some ungodly kings. There were two that were very evil, very wicked kings uh, that followed after him. And, uh, but we got uh, Josiah. He was, what, eight years old. He comes on. Eight years old. And he's like Hezekiah. Loves the Lord. But then you, you see, you had a king that loved God for 57 years and worshiped. Then you had a couple of kings in there that were evil and wicked. Then you get an eight-year-old kid. I tell you what, we need to have a heart of a kid again that has faith, that knows how to love. See, as we get older, we lose our faith and we forget how to love and we get hard and we get away from the things that really matter to us. But I can tell you right now, the thing that ought to matter to us is Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the one that ought to matter to us mostly in all. So we find that he also, like King Hezekiah, restored worship to Jehovah and Judah. But then behind Josiah, come four other kings. They covered 23 years. They were evil and ungodly men. Can you see the pattern that's beginning to take place? Here in Judah and Israel, it's the same thing that's taking place in America. We'll have a religious revival. Then we'll go back and have sin and ungodliness and wickedness. Either. Then we'll have a revival and we drop down. Can I tell you, it happens that way in our lives too often that we will get right with God and then we'll start getting away from Him. We'll get back in sin and living ungodly. And then it takes a great thing to change our lives. But if we're not careful, God will come along and whoop our behind him real good. He'll have to do something to us. I've given you some history. Now let me bring in Jeremiah. Let's bring you to the prophet of God. Now he came on the scene during the reign of the last five kings. He's there during this period. His ministry actually begins at King Josiah and follows on down. Now, even though Josiah was a good king and a godly man and all and tried to bring uh, Israel back, Israel still wasn't quite where they were. They're not right like they should be. They're not quite where they need to be with God. And so God puts out a godly man named Jeremiah and he gives him... Uh, to the nations to share the word of God and all. And we got Jeremiah come. Now here's something about Jeremiah. If you study anything about Jeremiah, he's called the weeping prophet. He's one with a broken heart. He is one that weeps and cries. He's a, have you ever been really broken hearted over something? Has something really just kind of crushed your heart? I've seen some people that things have happened in their life and they once lived for the Lord, loved the Lord, something came along and just crushed them so bad that they turned from God. They blamed God for what happened. Now let me just say something to you right here. It can happen in my life. It can happen in your life. Someone very dear you love could die untimely, as we would say now, it's not untimely with God. God knows what He's doing. But if we're not careful, we'll blame God. And I have to always ask this question. If that person you love dies, what makes you so special that they shouldn't have? Huh? 
Why should my mother, who died four years ago, get dementia and die in my years? Are you that special in God's eyes? No. Are we not all the same when it comes down to things like this? I mean, why should I be so blessed that my father's still alive and if he lives to June 5th, he'll be 94 years old? And not you. You see, we can't hold those things against God or blame God and get aggravated with God about these things. And you may be broken hearted about some things, but Jeremiah's brokenness that caused him to weep and to cry and all is different than that type of a broken heart. I, I know a fellow that lost a child and it's taken him years and years and years to get over it. It's just hurt that bad and all. But here is Jeremiah weeping problem. You know why he's weeping? Because he's a Jew and he loves the Jewish people. Amen. And God's told him about the destruction that's going to come and he's weeping, he's crying. Oh, Lord God. You know what we need? We need things to break our hearts so bad that we fall on our knees weeping and crying and praying and begging God to change things. Amen? I mean, aren't you brokenhearted yet of what's happening in America that you ought to be brought to your knees? Let's take it a little closer. Aren't you brokenhearted about what's happened in your family who's gotten away from God, who's not going to church, who's not living godly? That ought to break our hearts, to bring us to our knees, to cause us to weep, and to beg God to do something. Yeah. Jeremiah's broken. Really broken. I see the same thing happening in America that's happening to Judah and Israel. You know, my grandkids were growing up in a total different world than I grew up in. <coughs> oh my. We didn't sit around the house and do this. <laughs> you know what? You want to know what our phone call, our, our, our mobile phone was? I love it. Our mobile phone was Mama would go to the kitchen door and throw the screen open and say, it's time to come home for supper! <laughs> huh? There was five of us. I'm going to tell you, Mama didn't take time to call all five names, but everybody in the neighborhood knew Mama's voice. And I'll tell you right now, there was a few cousins that sat at the table. Well, Aunt Mark, you said come home and eat. Right? But we didn't have that. And you know what? We didn't, we didn't have one of these things. These kids got these remote controls for that TV. I was my daddy's remote control. But not a new boy. <laughs> Just some rabbit ears. Kids, they don't even know what rabbit ears is. Much less a party line. <laughs> don't you love the party line? Oh, the rotary phone, right? Yeah. They, what's that? They showed some kids one time here recently a pay phone. They looked at it and they said, what in the world's that? And I... Our world's changed. Yes. We played until dark. Outside. Yeah. But today we live in such a world that our kids are inside. We're scared to let them go outside. We have to have them in a chain link fence. They can't run up and down the street. We don't have to. It's terrible, isn't it? Yes. You know what's close to the point we're at today? Sin. It's sin. And sin has changed our nature. And I can tell you right now, I believe it's sin that's beginning to change us today. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Go to Georgia, 95, and turn around and come back. Do that. I, I really challenge you. Just go up 95. Go to Georgia, go to first exit, turn around and come back. Because what's going to happen is there's going to be a sign at four miles that says, move over, COVID check. I've been through it twice. Went through it Friday night, went through it yesterday. And it's amazing. They run you and they herd you down like you're cattle in a single line. I told Terry, I said, does this say anything to you? She said, yeah, we've got to stop. So they can tell us to go on. I said, I get that. 
But don't you see how quick the government is taking control of our lives? That's right. Can I tell you right now, that is as quick as sin is taking over America. That is how quick sin is taking over our lives. And we need to stop and do a little check. And we don't build our knees and we say, Preacher, I'm okay with God. Everything's right. Well, can I tell you, if you're all right, why are we on our knees? Why are we weeping? Why are we begging God to give us a spiritual revival in our church? Jeremiah's weeping because he knows what God's about to do. He knows what's about to happen. Now I'm in my text. That's my introduction. Uh, I'm done my last point. I just ain't preaching in a while, but here we are. The text. What is it about? God's giving Jeremiah a vision of what's coming. He's telling him what's going to happen. He says, write it in the book. Read the book of Jeremiah. That's the book that King Zedekiah was reading but the last two chapters. And those are the chapters that God told Jeremiah to add to the book. To add to the book. Jeremiah has got the message and he takes uh, Baruch and he says, I need you to write these things down and put them in a book. And he did. He said, now you take them. You go to the temple and you, you read them. Jeremiah couldn't go. The Bible says that at the time he couldn't go over to the temple. He said, you take Baruch and you go to the temple and you read them. So he reads this book over in the temple and people hear it. They go back and they tell King Zedekiah, you should have heard what we just heard read in the temple. And he said, well, I want to hear it. Go get the book. Bring it here. They bring the book before Zedekiah, the king of Judah. Now he's ungodly. He's evil. He's a wicked man. He does not love Jehovah God. He hears it. They start reading the book and he pulls out his knife. And he cuts it into pieces. And they say he's in the winter house, so it's the winter month. And he takes those pieces and he throws them into the fire to burn it up. And he, what he's doing is he's trying to get rid of that book. He's trying to get rid of the Word of God. He's trying to destroy the prophecy of what's going to happen to Judah. He's thinking that if I deny it, if I ignore it, if I don't pay attention to it, that it won't come true. I want you to know right now, God's Word is going to come true. It's real. And you can't do nothing to stop God's Word. Amen. Amen. Cut it up, tear it up. I've looked at it. Y'all know me. I'm narrow minded. I'm a King James Version guy. And I'm going to stay King James Version until I die. And I can tell you right now, you can take and rewrite these books. You can make them whatever you want to. And what's happened is the people who rewrite them are trying to get rid of God. They're trying to get rid of the Holy Spirit. They're trying to get rid of the virgin birth. They're trying to get rid of biblical doctrine. They're trying to change us. And I feel like they're doing just what I went through at the Georgia Florida line when I came in. They're hurting us into one word. Yes. Government, religion, monetary system, and all that. But I'm going to tell you right now, it'll never change the word of God. Because I've read this book, and I'm going to tell you right now, God is going to be in control to the very last second. Amen. It's His word. King, he tore it up and cut it up. You know what God said? Hey, Jeremiah. Write it again. Now I got a few more things I need to add. Well, I tell you what, it's better to accept what God says the first time than when God starts adding. Amen. I remember one time I got in some serious trouble. I did. Sixth grade, got in some serious trouble. That's behind me now, thank God. But I got in such serious trouble that when the state trooper brought my dad to where I was at, my brother in law came over. And dad sent my brother and I home. And when I got home, my brother-in-law with me. <laughs> wore me out. Now, I, you know, I'm done had a letter reply. And then daddy got home. After having the conversation with the state trooper. And he said, walk in your bedroom. Get your clothes off and I'll be there in just a moment. Now, Daddy never believed in any kind of protection. And I got in there, and Daddy took that little belt in my hand and wore me out. Can I tell you? It's kind of like what I see right here where God gives 
Was Zedekiah a message? And he didn't pay attention. So God said, oh, I'm going to give you another message. And this time, you're not going to like what you get the second time go around. I'll go ahead and tell you right now. I would have taken a second whipping from my brother-in-law over that last whipping from my daddy. And I'll tell you right now, you'd rather have one whipping from God than to have the second You'd rather have the chance to make things right than not. And I want you to know right now, you can say, I'm not going to pay attention to it. I'm going to ignore the Word of God. You can say, that's for somebody. I'm not going to do it. Let me tell you something. This Word of God is for all of us. Amen. You can ignore it all you want. You can deny it all you want, but that ain't going to change it. It's still going to be God's Word. Isaiah 55 11 says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper the thing whereunto I send it. See, this is God's word. Don't think it's up to somebody else to get right with God. Don't think it's up to the preacher. Don't think it's up. So the church, don't think it's up to us. It's up to us as individuals to accept the word of God and live by it. You can do whatever you want, but I'll tell you right now, you're not going to change God's word. It's going to come true. And it's going to happen. It's time for us to come back to God. To repent. To live for Him. And to get right with Him. And do the things God expects us to do. Do you want another chapter? Add it. Not me. I just want to be right with God. I want to be able to escape the chastisement of the Lord. What about you? Are you ready for God? Nobody else can do it but you. Nobody else can do it but me. And that is to be right with God. Are you where you should be? Zedekiah cut the book up and burned fire. Did that change anything? No. The only thing I know to change is as God speaks to our heart, He speaks to His Word, is to us address our problem at that time. Has God spoke to your heart today? Has He pointed something out to you? If He has, Brother Greg will come, we're going to have an invitation, and these altars will be open. If you need to be saved, this will be a good day to get saved, God, amen. Today is the day of salvation. Are you going to do what God called you to do? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you, God, for, for allowing me to preach today. To preach your word. How true the word is, God. I ask you now, God, that through this, somebody heard from the Holy Spirit that they're willing to change their life today. Pray God as we're praying right now that people that are spoken to by the Holy Spirit He's drawing them would be at this altar and be praying and asking God and begging God to change things. To forgive us of our sins. Lord, I pray during this invitation for thy will to be done. In Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Greg? 366. Won't you stand as we sing page 366? The altars are open. If you need to come, maybe you need to be like Jeremiah, weeping and praying for somebody. Won't you come as we sing page 366?
Well, I'll tell you what, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stand waiting for next Sunday. Uh, Mother's Day next Sunday, amen? Uh, come, let's honor our mothers, right? If your mom's alive and she's able and can, bring her. Try to get her here. We all like me, your mom's not with us. She's with the Lord. And I wouldn't bring her back for nothing. Amen. Amen. But next Sunday, uh, let's honor our mothers. 10 a.m., we'll be right back here. I'm not getting you coffee and donuts every Sunday. <laughs> this is a special day. So we got God for you to get you breakfast and uh, come on next Sunday here at 10 o'clock. You know, if you missed out, by the way, if you missed out this morning, did you get here at 9 30? You missed out on a clip that was shown in the back, back here. Um, there was only three, two or three spots in it that was messed up. I will tell you that. So you've seen the clip, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, the rest of it was pretty good. But I don't know if you can get to see it again, but and we had the clip back there. Keep watching Facebook. Keep sharing. Let me tell you how important it is for you to share Facebook and all. The little commercials, the Gideon Bible study, the different things that we're doing and all. You wouldn't believe how far this is getting out. And people that are hearing it and are seeing it and all. I stopped at the gas station the other day and this woman said to me, she said, I saw your clip. And she said, where are y'all relocating to? And I, I said, hallelujah. You know? And uh, when y'all get to Callahan, I need to know I'm coming to church. You're three miles from us. I said, hallelujah. Ain't that great? Keep sharing. Keep getting these out there and let people know because we're coming. Amen? Amen. But right now, we're right here. And we need to do right here what we would do right up there. And that's to come and worship the Lord. Next Sunday, 10 a.m., pray for uh, Brother Ray Bass. Pray for uh, Miss Mel. And uh, lift the others up you may know. And Brother McGill's brother, pray for him. And all. So we want to remember these people in our prayers throughout the week and all. Well, amen.